Team Keep It Clean, we done finally made it to Ravens versus Browns. And this has been a game that a lot of us have been waiting for for a very, very long time. Two teams that just seem to have inconsistencies flying left and right. They don't even know who they are yet. And we already in week 12. But Team Keep It Clean, this should be a very good one. And to preview this game, I couldn't think of any other guest that I could possibly have that could do it better. Then our special guest for this one, and I'll go ahead and let him introduce himself. Yeah, this feels like a dream. Ain't you no know chance what I mean. You see my boy, he like got to made it, how to made it. Boy, he's a fan, and he like the Ravens, like the Ravens. To you too, team, keep it clean. What's going on? It's Dane Graven here with another video and another very, very special guest. I know y'all are familiar with him, but I'm gonna go ahead and let my boy QC introduce himself. What's going on, my friend? It's Baltimore's favorite. It's <laughs> if you've watched AFC North Talk, the man responsible for your first five wins plus one. I got an L one this week because I told Sonny not to predict a blowout. And I said, every time y'all predict a blowout, the Ravens like win by two. So I told him not to do it. They gave y'all that extra juice at the end of the game to win it. I call that an and one. So the man responsible for six of the Ravens wins, and I'm not Lamar Jackson, uh, right here, Raven fans, favorite Browns fan is Quincy here in the flesh, as I always love to do here on Engraving's channel. That's <laughs> good, man. I appreciate you coming on, man. Um, so real quick. Just to take it back, like I guess way back, how did you become a Browns fan? That's something uh we all want to know. How'd you become a Browns fan? I mean, I just kind of grew up with it, right? Um, so I, I was born in '95, so the team had moved when I was born, but by the time I was old enough, they had came back. Um, and you know, it's just you watch the game that's on in the house, the Browns are on in the house because my dad is a huge Browns fan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just grew up watching it. I remember one of the first football memories I have. This is no joke. 2004 season opener. Browns versus Ravens. Browns won that game 20 to 3. And that was the last time we have won the home opener <laughs> with a, the first game of the year. Um, oh, wow. But that is one of my first football memories. And then the 2007 season kind of sealed it in for me. Um, and Raven fans won, would know that season because that was kind of a bad one for y'all. It was where the Browns were like a surprise 10 and 6. There was that gooseneck game versus the Ravens in Emmett T Bank Stadium where Phil Dawson kicked a uh, field goal that bounced off the back of the field goal mm. back through the front, but they said it was good because it hit the back extension post instead of the front bar. I don't know if people are still upset about it because the Ravens went, what, 6 to 10 that year? So <laughs> no harm, no foul, right? It's just another loss in the pile for y'all that year. <laughs> but uh, And ever since then, you know, there's been definitely some rough patches, but mm, been a Browns yeah, fan yeah. ever <laughs> since then. <laughs> Okay. All right. So with that being said, now the here, the now the 2021, how are you feeling about the direction that the Browns are headed in right now? I'm confused, uh, mm -hmm. honestly, by this team, right? Because going into this season, I mean, you look at the roster and it makes sense, right? 2019 was a different kind of disappointment where like you looked at the roster, but you saw some holes in it and you're like, well, maybe they'll fix it. Maybe Greg Robinson will be a good tackle. You know what I mean? You were hoping on hope for a lot of players who were not established in the NFL to be good or to improve. This year's different. You didn't have those same holes. You had what should be one of the best rosters in football. Mm -hmm. And what's been frustrating about this Cleveland Browns team, especially offensively, is the level of execution has just been subpar i mean the level of plays there the players are there but the execution has been off you know even in the run game at times it hasn't been there when it's needed to um bad penalties you know for uh you know people want to know why the offenses look so bad it's because we keep getting false starts and holdings on first downs which kills the drive you know this is something that kills baltimore at the beginning of the games getting those penalties early in drives and this has kind of just been what it's been with the cleveland browns baker hasn't played well that's very disappointing considering how we played last year. Um, you know, the offense hasn't looked great. We had to trade Odell for no – well, not even trade him. We had to cut Odell uh, to fix the offense. And then since we've cut Odell, yeah, we put up the 42 points against Cincinnati. But in the last two weeks, 
we put up what? 21 points, you know, against the Patriots and the Lions. Yeah. So it's been disappointing. It's been frustrating. But like I tell Browns fans, even though it's been like that, ain't time to quit because you're still in the thick of it. You know, six and five, yeah. you're still in the thick of it. You could be in first place in the snap of a knot. Yeah, that's true because this AFC, like, there has not been one dominant person in the AFC. It was looking like, all right, well, maybe – I know the, the Titans, they lost to the Jets, but okay, that was a fluky game maybe. All right, look, the Titans, they whooped up on the Rams. They beat, beat them down. But okay, maybe the Titans are that dominant team, but nope. They go out and lose to the uh, the Texans. The Texans, who had before that, I believe they only won one game. The Chiefs, I mean, they haven't looked dominant uh, all season. I know they've been on a winning streak these last, what, three, four games. Uh, and then the Bills, them too, they they looked like they were something early on. But now recently, same thing. So yeah, two very questionable losses there for them. Yeah. So there, there's been, there hasn't been anybody in the AFC where it's like, all right, yep, that's the team right there. Those are the ones. It is literally wide open. Now, something that – doesn't seem as if it's wide open is Andrew Barry's checkbook. Now, he did give a couple of offensive linemen some extensions. So those guys' job is to protect Baker Mayfield. Now, uh, Baker Mayfield, he I, I've been wondering. Like, they did pick up the fifth-year option, so he's got that for sure. Um, but why do you think and where do you think the Browns are – when it comes to a contract extension with Baker Mayfield? Why do you think it hasn't happened yet? And do you believe that he is in a position, has he earned that big money uh, from the Browns? At this point, if I'm evaluating what Baker has done this year, mm -hmm. I don't think an extension is on the table for this year. Uh, maybe they ride this thing out to his fifth year, and then, you know, if he shows promise, they give him to his uh, contract. I mean, not his contract, his franchise tag or something like that. They still got to figure out what they're going to do with Denzel Ward because that's the only other piece they haven't locked up long term along with Baker Mayfield. Right. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, I would love to say and sit here, Baker's been playing like a franchise guy. I'm proud of him. I hope he gets that extension, you know. But, that just hasn't been the level of play we've seen here in Cleveland. And if that's going to be the case, right, you have to do the math with the franchise quarterback. I always thought that people worry too much about how much you pay your franchise quarterback because, honestly, whether you pay Lamar $30 million, 35, 45, 50 million, Lamar's going to be worth it because Lamar is going to be that piece that puts you over the top, right? Um, Baker this year has not shown that he is – up to that spec, right? He has not played at that level. He's not elevated this team. Down the stretch here, we'll find out, though, because you're not going to beat the Ravens without him making plays as a quarterback. And you're not going to beat a lot of these teams down the stretch with them. But as far as extending Baker, he's on the verge of us bringing in somebody to compete with them or, or a better backup than Case Keenum hmm. to have in there next year because the, the sad truth of this is – I think Baker Mayfield is talented. I think the world of his talent, I think people don't talk about how talented he is enough, but the level of play hasn't been consistent. And this is not a team that is waiting for somebody to become consistent, right? This is a team that needs to win right now because the roster is win now, mm -hmm. right now. You can't waste that um, waiting on inconsistent quarterback play. And if that's the case, you know, this is how Phillip Rivers took Drew Brees' spot and Drew Brees ended up in um, New Orleans, this is how Brett Favre ended up in Green Bay. This is how guys get ousted before they're ready just because these things aren't lining up, and I just hope that Baker can get more consistent quicker so this doesn't become a, a issue to where we're talking about moving on from a guy who I think has a ton of potential, but he's not helping himself or us right now by his play. That's, that's for certain. Yeah, that's interesting because I um I had a conversation with one of my guys, Josh, about the whole Baker Mayfield and his contract situation. And my thing was, I, I think the Browns, I, I think that they wouldn't even talk about a contract extension this year. Um, but one of those reasons, I think, is because he's dealing with an injury right now. So I don't feel like the Browns would really feel like they could get a full, proper evaluation of Baker Mayfield, even though you got the previous three years to look off, look at, too. 
Um, but I think they do like really ride this thing out because again, they got the fifth year option with him. Um, so they got him next year. And then, yeah, like you mentioned, that franchise tag is, is a real possibility. Uh, but we'll see what happens when we get to that point. But where we are right now, Baker Mayfield's been dealing with an injury. How concerned are you with Baker Mayfield's health, especially going into this game with the Ravens? It's been a talk. It's been a, it's been a conversation, a topic of conversation uh, amongst people who follow the Browns, right? I'm going to be honest with you. When I look at the tape, when I look at the All-22, I want to be careful with how I say this because I don't want to sound callous. I understand he is hurt. I understand that he is playing with some injuries, but I don't think these injuries are what's affecting his play to this point to where he's been playing this back. So, you know, because the fact is, you can see every week he's had this injury, he can still rip the ball downfield. He can still go cross field. He can still run, throw on his run, be accurate but he's just not doing it consistently enough. And when he's missing, he's missing in very similar ways that he's missed in the past. So I don't think this has as much to do about his injury as it does about his play, right? I think his play is just bad. Whether he was injured or not, I don't know if that's really that relevant because it's just, you know when a quarterback's injured when you watch him and he shouldn't be out there. This is just not what I'm seeing with him. Uh, so that's been one thing. As far as worrying about his injury, look, you're always going to be worried because the Ravens are relentless with that blitzing. But Baker's a tough dude, right? Baker's going to be able to take the hits. He's going to be able to absorb the contact, and he's going to be able to absorb the pain. The question I have is not about whether he can physically hold up, but, you know, when he's in the pocket and that pressure's coming, is he going to step up in the pocket, take that hit, and throw the ball like he did against Cincinnati, or is he going to flush too early like he's done at the beginning of this year um, and force himself into bad decisions because he, he's taking himself out the play. That's really the concern there, right? And Calais Campbell is another monster concern because Baker Mayfield, we know, has issues going across the middle because he's shorter. Those passing lanes are harder to come by in the middle, and they're going to be especially hard to come by because I know Calais Campbell listed at like 6'8", but his arm span, his wingspan got to be like 7'7". Seven seven. Yeah, like, he crazy. is long. He is mm -hmm. long and he is very smart, right? You know, I was breaking down some defensive tackle tape a couple of weeks ago, and I was saying you can always tell the good defensive tackles from the bad ones because a good defensive tackle, you think they beat, they're just forcing themselves into a passing lane to get that arm up. And Calais Campbell's tape is nothing but savvy veteran stuff like that. He's a great player. Um, and that's going to be something that he has to look out for, right? Them tip balls can turn into interceptions real quick. They can turn into fumbles. They can turn into sacks. Um and that's something that is concerned also. You know, the way the Ravens disguise their defenses has been an issue with Baker Mayfield. You look at the last three game, two games he's played in against the Lions and the uh, New England Patriots, those are two teams that can disguise their defense as well enough that it really threw off Baker Mayfield. So, again, the injuries are one thing. Yeah. I am confident that, you know, he is tough enough to get out of that game and not be hurt at the end of it or not, you know, be – at risk of not playing for the rest of the year at the end of it, especially with the bye week um, in between. But, you know, my real concern is about how he's going to respond to how the Ravens are going to play him. That's really my mm -hmm. biggest concern. There. Now, that's funny that you um you just now brought up Calais Campbell uh, because that took me back to last year, uh, his very first game as a Raven, uh, 2020 season, home opener, got the Browns coming to town, division game, the very literally the very first play. Browns got the ball on offense. The very first play. Baker Mayfield drops back, throws it. Calais Campbell reaches him, them arms up, tips the ball. Marlon Humphrey interception. Now, something that we uh we talked about briefly offline was the streak that you brought to my attention that I, I hadn't even been aware of. Uh, and that that was the the streak that uh Baker Mayfield has thrown at least one interception every single time he's played the Ravens. Now, with that streak, do you think that streak will continue in this game? I hope it doesn't, right? He's thrown enough interceptions over the last two <laughs> weeks. Um, you know, he could give us a break this week. <laughs> but when you see the teams that he throws interceptions against and you see the issues that he has, 
there's no reason to believe he won't this week, right? Like the Ravens, they do a lot of the similar stuff that the Patriots did, that the Lions did to force him to throw interceptions. Um, and now he's at a point to where he's pressing a little bit more. I don't think he breaks that interception streak. And that's going to be tough to come back from. You can't give the Ravens the ball and expect to win. Um, but that's where we're just going to need Miles Garrett to step up and force his own turnovers or, or change the game in that way. But, yeah, man, uh, Baker's always had a rough go of it against the Ravens. Um, when it comes to not turning the ball over. And it's not for no reason. It's for very good reasons. The Ravens put the hands up at the line of scrimmage. They're very good at tipping those balls in the line of scrimmage. And they're very good at disguising their coverages. And, you know, Tyus Bowser has been a recipient of many of those, oh, I'm going to blitz. Now nah, I'm covering the tight end interceptions <laughs> that, you know, Baker is kind of prone to throwing. Yeah. That's for sure, man. You know, man. So ho hopefully he does continue the streak. I, I don't want to see it broken like 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 oh, Brock yeah. Lesnar and Undertaker with that streak. You're a traditionalist, huh? You don't you don't you don't want to see tradition broken. Right. It's <laughs> I, like I, if I it ain't broke, fine with the change. I'm just gonna go on a record. You know, I would be fine with the change, you know. <laughs> oh, two wins in, in three years versus Baltimore. We could change up that tradition and you know go the other way with it, you know, let the Browns start dominating this series. We could start with two wins this year. Mm. Uh, if, if the Ravens could be so kind. Now, um, with this series, <laughs> it's it's going to be like literally back to back. Uh, Ravens play the Browns this week. Then next week, the Ravens play the Steelers while the Browns just sitting back watching, relaxing, taking it all in. Everybody's chilling. They got the week off because they're on the bye. So then the, the following week, the Ravens got to travel to the Browns. How advantageous do you feel that is for Cleveland? This is your last chance to wake up, Cleveland. Like, this is the, this is the one you cannot waste, right? You get Baltimore coming off a little bit of a rough week here um, against a, tough, a tougher than expected game against Chicago. <laughs> and, you know, you get them on Sunday Night Football, M&T Bank Stadium. Look, it's going to be a tough go. But if you can will yourself, force yourself to win this week, you get a bye week, and then you get Baltimore after a – what we know is going to be a tough game versus the Steelers. That yeah. rivalry is not dead yet. Um, at home, that's your ticket to erase the entire first half of this season. <laughs> if, if, if you get these two wins – Everything else that happens before this, this, that point does not matter. It is irrelevant. I, nobody's going to care how you played against the Lions. Nobody's going to care that you let the Patriots put 45 unanswered on you because <laughs> you won these two games. All of a sudden, you're going to be either in first place or tied for first place or either like a half game out of first place. And you're going to have a much better chance of making a wild card if it comes down to that because you would have given the Ravens two really, really, really hard losses to come back from on the um, when it comes to the wild card tiebreakers and when it comes to the division tiebreakers, right? So this is your golden ticket, Cleveland. Like, this is the golden ticket for Cleveland. These two weeks, if they well, – these three weeks, if they take advantage, if they win these three weeks, they're in – Golden prime position. We back talking about Super Bowl again, being irresponsibly optimistic, right? <laughs> like we're back on the golden ticket if we can get these two wins in three weeks. Okay. If not, we just going to try our best to ruin Cincinnati and Pittsburgh season because that's all <laughs> you can do at that point, right? Like, so it's one or the other, right? This is the golden ticket. If you kind of split it, you kind of continue what you're going on here. But if you get the full golden ticket, which is two wins against Baltimore in three weeks, you're back on track. Whether mm. you deserve it or not, because they don't, they've been playing that bad. But you get these two wins, all of a sudden, things look a lot rosier than they did a month ago. Right? It's a Kevin Costner quote from Draft Day. You ever seen that movie where it's like, we live in a different world than we did at 7 o'clock in the morning because the dude tried to give him a bad trade? I don't know. It's a deep cut. If you ever seen Draft Day, you know what I'm talking about. But – yeah, you can wake up three weeks from now living in a whole different world than you can if you're the Cleveland Browns if you get these two wins in three weeks. But it comes against a team that I don't know if you've ever swept uh, since I, – yeah, I, I can't even say since coming back because the Ravens didn't exist until the Browns went away. Um, so 
the yeah, I don't know if you've ever swept the Ravens, but you're going to have to do that. And this version of the Ravens, you haven't even come close to sweeping. So, you know, it's going to be difficult, but that's the path for the Cleveland Browns. It's all ahead of them. I don't think they've ever swept the Ravens. Maybe did they, in 2007, did they beat them twice when they had Ray Lewis, when we had Jamal Lewis? I do not remember. That's I a, can look a, it up. That's a nice little uh, yeah, history but, topic, history question. Hmm. All right. I thought they did, but yeah, that's where they're at, you know. Okay. Well, yeah, we had to look that up. But um, somebody who the Ravens are going to – though they don't actually have to look up because they know all about him uh, is Nick Chubb. Uh, Nick Chubb, he made his big return. Uh, Kareem Hunt, uh, he'll be back. He should be back for this game too. Uh, Dearness Johnson, uh, he's been there the whole time, uh, holding it down while those guys were out. Um, how – just having a run game like that, how – Happy does that make you when your run when your run game from your running backs is so strong? Because like we we got a run game, but most of our run game is from Lamar. Now Devontae Freeman recently he's been chiming in a lot more, but most of our running game usually comes from Lamar. But for for you to have your your running backs doing as great as they are, how good does that feel? It's kind of been interesting, right? Because as good as those running backs are, and look, when we need the big play, they usually come away with it. But this is another thing where it's like, I know that the numbers look great for this running back unit. Mm -hmm. I know that, you know, the averages and everything do. But for whatever reason, when I watch this play to play this year versus last year, it doesn't seem like we're getting the same chunks per play. We're getting longer chunks at certain parts of the game, right? Nick Chubb will break something off for like 40, 50 yards, mm -hmm. but then we'll have a lot of two-yard carries in between mm. that. Um, okay. And I think that's kind of inflated the average to where, yeah, it looks like it's last year's run game, but I don't think it's as good as last year's run game right here. Like last year, I would have no doubt that the Browns could run the ball at will against Baltimore. We struggled at times to run that ball versus the Detroit Lions, and they're 29th in run defense. So, mm -hmm. you know, this week with Calais Campbell, with Brandon Williams out there, I I'm not so sold that running the ball is going to be what's going to be able to move the football this week. And I do think that, you know, if you want to win this game, Baker's going to have to play well. And, you know, when you gamble it on that, this year, at least, last year I felt a lot better about it, more confident about it. But this year, mm -hmm. you know, it, it's not as sure of a thing as you would hope. Um, but that's kind of been what this season has been. By the way, answer to your question, 2007 was the last and only time oh, the Browns did. have swept the Ravens. Okay. Yeah, they well, did do it. Now we know. So as long as that history stays history uh, and, and, and chills in 2007, then we'll be good. Um, we had Jamal Lewis on that team, I remember. Yeah, that was the – we got Jamal Lewis. Yeah, that was so weird, man. Yeah, he was really good for like two years for the Browns too. I was like, why did Jamal Lewis come here? Okay, you know, I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you just talked about Baker Mayfield, uh, how the, the run game, um, it, it may not the, – the numbers don't tell the whole story. Um, and that Baker Mayfield, he'll need to play better. Now, I saw a clip the other day uh, from Jarvis Landry um, talking about how he, he doesn't know why he's not getting the ball. He doesn't know why he's not more involved. Um, how, how has the, the wide receiver room been since the departure of Mr. Odell Beckham Jr.? And are you confident in the guys that you do have uh, that remain on the roster, <laughs> like a Jarvis Landry, like a – Donovan Peoples Jones. I mean, you could throw the tight ends in there too. David Njoku. Um, even though I, I I didn't watch the Lions game at all, so I'm not sure how they did in that. But I did watch that uh, that Patriots game where he uh, Baker Mayfield perfect pass hit him right in the chest, and he just kind of gave that little half effort yeah. and whatnot. Uh, and I, th I think maybe he thought, okay, I got it. It's gonna be a touchdown. It should be straight. But then the Patriots defender came out, whacked it out. Um, but how, how, how has the receiving core been without Odell? You know, it's an interesting thing, right? Because people, in the, we get so wrapped up with, with the, uh, what would you say, the glamorous stuff of Odell at times where people mm -hmm. focus on Odell and they go, oh, man, Odell, he's this and that. And 
the thing that people always lose sight of is that Odell is not seen like that inside of NFL locker rooms. They like Odell, right? Like the wide receivers liked Odell. The people on the team like Odell. Mm-hmm. The people who cover the team like Odell. He's a hard worker. He is always, he's one of those guys that's going to be there first. He's going to be doing the extra stuff. You know, the, the ideal of him being a diva just didn't really match up because he's not really a diva. He's just a hard worker and he's a wide receiver and he wants the ball. You know what right. I mean? Like, because. I mean, I would put it like this, right? If you thought you were really good at your job and your job wasn't letting you fix a problem you feel like mm-hmm. you could easily fix, you'd be mad too, right? Exactly. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like if I were on a podcast and they didn't let me talk on a podcast, <laughs> I would be mad too because I feel like I could add something to the podcast. You know, That's I mean? true. I feel like I have enough that, you know, they could let me get some, some run on there. So – that's where the frustration was. And that's not just Odell that's frustrated. Odell was the first person to like, I don't know how, I don't know the details of it, but it would seem as if he tried to get himself off the team with how orchestrated things were on the trade deadline. Mm-hmm. But the whole wide receiver room feels like that. And they're not a part of this team. I broke, I broke this down on um, a film breakdown a couple of weeks ago where I said, the Ravens are a run first team. Everybody would agree with that, right? The Ravens run the ball more often or or they're known or seen as a run first. Team. All right. The Ravens' best receiver or their number one receiver when it comes to snaps is Hollywood Brown. Hollywood yep. Brown has 500 snaps on the field. 365 of those are pass snaps as of like two weeks ago when I recorded this video. Mm-hmm. Okay. Donovan Peoples-Jones is the highest snap leader for the Browns. We don't know if he's going to play. It's not looking good. It's not looking like he's going to play. Oh. He has 360 snaps, and only 200 of those were passing snaps. And only 22 of those passing snaps were targets. Hollywood Brown got 73. <laughs> Donovan Peoples-Jones, he doesn't get the same snaps as a wide receiver. Or Jarvis Landry, right? And... Whatever you think of uh, Marquise Brown, I'm done trolling Marquise Brown at this point because he's actually a good wide receiver. But whatever you think of Marquise Brown, you would actually think that, you know, Jarvis and Hollywood Brown, they're probably in the same class of wide receiver. Um, They're not that far away from being that different, right? Nobody would say that one is that much better than the other. Jarvis gets five targets a game. Hollywood Brown gets nine. You know, one team has a concerted effort to get their playmakers the ball at the wide receiving position, even though they run a lot, and another team is not. And that's why the wide receiving room is unhappy, because you have playmakers there that you aren't letting get the ball and making plays, and this offense has lacked playmaking. So when they see that the offense is lacking playmaking and they're still not getting the ball, that's going to breed frustration. I don't care who's in there. You can have Anquan Bowden. You can have Larry Fitzgerald. You can have A.J. Green. You can have Heinz Ward. You can have all the high-character wide receivers you want. They will lose their mind in that situation because at the end of the day, people are really good at football because they know they can impact the game with the ball in their hands. And if they're not going to get that opportunity to get the ball in their hands, they're going to be frustrated, and that's why they're frustrated. And I don't blame them for being frustrated. That's on the coaching staff. That's on the offensive coordinator and Kevin Stefanski mm-hmm. to stop that from happening. If they tried some things, but sometimes it's just as simple as put more wide receivers on the field instead of going 12 personnel all the time. They don't want mm-hmm. to get away from that, and that's kind of been the friction of this offense. Mm-hmm. Some powerful words right there. Um, so – in conclusion, heading into this game, what would you say the Browns' biggest strength and biggest biggest weakness are uh, going against the Ravens this Sunday night? Their biggest strength and their biggest weakness. I'm going to go with a more zen answer. The Browns' <laughs> biggest strength is their biggest weakness. And what is that? It's their inconsistency. This team could play like they did against Detroit and walk out there and find a way to beat Baltimore by 20 points on national TV and look amazing. Out of nowhere, seemingly, because they're that talented, they can do it. 
but they're horribly inconsistent. We don't know what to expect out of this team. And when you don't know what to expect out of a team, it makes figuring out how you're going to defend Lamar. Oh, we're going to put this player on him. Well, this player's inconsistent. You can't put somebody inconsistent on Lamar Jackson. That's a recipe for disaster, right? So the inconsistency of this team, I wouldn't be surprised if the Browns got a big lead early in this game. Can they hold it? Can they play four quarters? Can they be consistent? And if they do, can they get that bye week after a big win and come back and win again? Are they going to be consistent? That's their biggest strength, and that's their biggest weakness. The strength, it's the strength is because you played two bad games. And right now you need to be inconsistent from that because you don't want that to be consistent, right? The two games you just played. So you need to be inconsistent. But it's a weakness because nobody knows or trusts what they can get out of this team or any given player on this team on a given play. And when you don't have that, that has issues, right? Baltimore has all these issues. They have played, they have played horrible at times, but they're still seven and three and in first place. Why is that? Because at the end of the day, no matter what Lamar does in quarters one through three, you know, in the fourth quarter, if he got seven points that he needs to score, that that's that's Lamar going to do that. Lamar is going to make that happen. If you need a field goal at the end of a game, if the team does not have a more than, by the way, this is a big key this week, uh, three-point leads, two-point leads, they mean nothing <laughs> against Baltimore. They mean absolutely nothing against Baltimore. So, But you know, as a Raven fan, if a team goes up by two with like what, a, with anything less than like 30 seconds left, oh, yeah, we got a timeout, 45 seconds. That's two throws and a kick. We good, you know, so they at least have that level of consistency that they know how to finish these games. And again, if you look at the trends, Baltimore Ravens have been the ultimate find a way to win team. They put themselves in bad positions. They dig themselves in holes, but they find a way to dig themselves out at the end of the day. The Cleveland Browns are the exact opposite where they can't get out of their own way at the end of games. They can't stop from tripping over their feet in the red zone. They can't figure out a way to close games out, right? The Detroit game's a key example. Up 13-0 the whole game. All you had to do was score one more touchdown. DeAndre Swift can't run no more. Boom. That's ball game. You're going to win that game by 20 points. But you hold this thing out. The, the Minnesota game where they couldn't score to go away touchdown. <clears throat> Multiple games. Uh, the L.A. Chargers game, right? Similar thing where they couldn't put it away. Mm. If you have that as your problem, as your team that cannot put away games versus the Baltimore Ravens, who if you don't put it away, boy, are they going to come back and bite you? <laughs> yeah, that, that you has been the, uh, the Ravens this year. Yeah, the comeback kings. Yeah, and we know that Lamar is more than capable of making them comebacks against Cleveland because, you know, we joke about the poop game. But I saw that he had these stomach issues going into this week, and I'm like, is he going to have a super poop game? <laughs> like, is he going to go bigger, better, and better for the sequel? Like, are we going to see something crazy on Sunday night? Is he going to miss, like, two quarters, come back now, 28, <laughs> and just win the game? I'm terrified. <laughs> oh, look, look, Lamar got to go to the bathroom in the middle of this game, and I'm going to just send you your GG and just let you win that one because <laughs> I already know what, what that is. I don't want nothing to do with that Lamar, uh, man. <laughs> with that Lamar situation that happened last year. <laughs> Yeah, well, we we're gonna see. Uh, one one last question before I get out of here. Um, but before we get out of here, Ravens, um, they they've been struggling on the offensive line this year, and I can't believe that I forgot to to, to bring these guys up earlier. Um, but Ravens offensive line that has struggled versus Miles Garrett and Jadavian Clowney. How well have they, have they been playing this year? And uh, what what would your expectations be for them? Those two going into this game. Oh, they've been fantastic. Jadavion yeah. Clowney and Miles Garrett have been fantastic. Miles Garrett, I think, you know, if he had a stronger game against the Lions, he might be in a run for defensive player of the year. But again, we talk about the um, perception of national TV games, right? Miles going to be coming out here looking to have a three sack game because he knows if he sacks Lamar Jackson three times, put that defensive player of the year award in his name and send it to him because what he would have like 16 and a half sacks in 12 weeks or something crazy like that. Mm -hmm. And then the national audience would have got to see him. So yeah, you know, 
Miles, Miles has been playing excellent. Um, another guy that I don't think Raven fans know about is Malik McDowell. That's been a gem. He was a guy that we took. He was from the Eagles? Mm, nah, he was from the Seahawks. Former second round pick, got in trouble the with Eagles. the police. Um early in, before he even went to rookie camp he got like in some kind of issue with the police um got cut made his way back into the nfl by being on the browns rookie camp this year and he's been the best defensive tackle on the team by far i mean he's a little bit of a he's a he's a little bit like calais campbell when you see him he's long strong tall very very good football player i'm excited about malik mcdowell but yeah i think those three that's going to be the Browns' key, right? If you can get behind that offensive line, if you can get Lamar in, in third and longs, if you can force them out of their game plan um, and, and put a lid on Hollywood Brown because the Browns have had an issue putting lids on wide receivers this year, <laughs> you are going to be in a good position here, right? Because your defensive line can definitely win that battle along the line of scrimmage. So that's the Browns' biggest saving grace. If I can depend on anything, I would hope that that's something I could depend on. <laughs> All right, Q, I, I appreciate you coming on and coming through to the channel as always. Um, I will definitely uh, be seeing you in a couple of weeks as well uh, when we match up once again. Um, but go ahead and let everybody know where they can find you at, YouTube, channel, Instagram, Twitter, all of that good stuff. Yeah, if you want to find Baltimore's favorite stepchild, <laughs> <laughs> you can find me on YouTube.com slash Quincy Carrier. If you just want to put it in the search bar, search Quincy Carrier, Q-U-I-N-C-Y-C-A-R-R-I-E-R. A lot of Raven fans already be hanging out there because I heard from y'all at the end of that Lions game. Y'all was in the chat. LOL, beat the Lions by three. We about to whip you at the bank. So I know y'all be there already. So, you know, check me out there if you haven't. You have friends there on that channel. But uh, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that notification bell. And, again, me and the Raven, we're going to be on live on Sunday night. So mm -hmm. if this is going really well for you Baltimore Raven fans, I know where you're going to want to come. <laughs> come on in. As long as you're polite, as long as you take your shoes off before you come in, you know what I mean? We could come hang out. All right. I appreciate it. With well, on that note, we'll see how this game goes and may the best team this week, because it's been so much inconsistency, may the best team this week get the win. Definitely, man. Appreciate it. Shout out to Graven, man.